May 2, 1945. Berlin. They found him. Hitler's body lay in the trench like a broken doll, bloody, disfigured by a gunshot to the forehead. The rumors were confirmed. He committed suicide. Soldiers were taking pictures near the deceased Führer when screams were heard from the bunker. Soldiers discovered another body in the crater from the bomb blast. It was the partially burned body of Adolf Hitler. The German soldiers held in the bunker testified that they removed it from the Führer's office and then incinerated it. This discovery in the Soviet archives was kept secret for a long time. The Russian government only declassified this information in the year 2000. And besides, there's another amazing fact. Hitler's body was discovered in the Reich Chancellery on May 2, 1945. Which one was the actual Führer, and was he even there? Sensational details about the last days of Adolf Hitler's life. Who actually died in the Führer's bunker on the day Berlin fell? Genetic testing, however, revealed that it was not Hitler's blood. Two dead Hitlers and both are doubles. Unique account of a former Soviet photographer who personally saw copies of the Führer. Personally, I knew it was a setup. Of course, there were doubts, because anything could happen. After all, any kind of rumor could be spread, you know, about the fact that he shot himself and so on. However, I did not shoot him like Hitler himself. I filmed him as a double for Hitler. Examination of Hitler's handwriting. The Führer's confidential directives were signed by various individuals. First, there was the actual Hitler, as seen in this photograph with his signature from the passport. But in the 42nd, 43rd, 44th and beyond, it could be a different person. Adolf Hitler's doubles, the Reich leader's top secret weapon. They saved the Führer from bullets and bombs, and with their assistance, Hitler executed his final grand performance, leaving the bodies of the doubles in the bunker to carry out an astonishing escape plan. Historical records don't back the assertion that Hitler fled Berlin on April 20th, 1945. It's widely accepted that he perished in his Berlin bunker on April 30th, 1945. Could Hitler have escaped from Berlin? If so, where did he flee to? We will conduct our own investigation. Let's try to decipher one of the 20th century's biggest mysteries, the puzzle of Adolf Hitler's death and last days. The year 1933, they navigated the extensive underground labyrinths, hardly breathing due to the tension. Their hands were trembling, their hearts were thumping with fear, and only one thought echoed in their minds. Survive, survive, at all costs. Now a daunting test awaited them. Only the finest, most precise duplicates of Adolf Hitler were to remain alive. His future deputy duplicates. For a long time, no one referred to them by their names, only by numbers. Their past didn't exist. It was erased. Now these people desired one thing, to emulate Hitler, so the lives of his lookalikes now depended on it. This secret started to unfold due to the unique archives that surfaced in the late 90s in Switzerland. These are the interrogation records of SS Chief Heinrich Müller. As it turned out, he was secretly transported to the United States after the war. There, the prisoner disclosed the sensational fact that Hitler had doubles. Dozens were prepared, but only those personally approved by the Reich Chancellor survived.
It is common for politicians to have doubles. Stalin had such doppelgangers. Many prominent political figures likely had such doubles. After all, how does one ensure the safety of a head of state? The security service is tasked with this consideration. Their eyes were blinded by a bright light. A short man entered the hall. The prisoners froze. He was just like Adolf Hitler. But this Hitler was indeed real. People became terrified. No one knew what to expect from this frightening, perilous man. He has already moved down the line here. There is intensity and hostility in his eyes. He carefully and meticulously examined each duplicate. Numbers 247. It was these three prisoners whom Hitler named who would remain alive. Others will be executed in the basement of the house. And numbers two, four, and seven will begin a new life. From that point forward, they will become clones of Hitler. These doubles will start to stand in for him at parades and inconsequential meetings. They will be photographed in place of the Fuhrer, surrounded by children and workers. But the most important thing is that they will save Hitler's life. Yeah. Body doubles were not only used for protection, they stepped in for the actual person when their immediate presence was not necessary. For instance, during large public events, where the requirement was simply to appear, wave a hand, utter a few words, and depart. Or when there is a significant risk of an assassination attempt, that is, there is a direct threat to the individual. The year is 1938, Munich. He was clutching his throat and convulsing. His pale, exhausted face was contorted with pain. The stunned officers could do nothing. They gathered in this beer hall to congratulate the Fuhrer on the successful launch of a grand military campaign. But instead of celebrating, they were forced to witness in horror as Hitler writhed in his death throes. He didn't even have time to utter a word. He drank some water, turned pale, and collapsed on the floor. And then he froze with a glassy-eyed stare. Panic erupted in the pub. The news of Hitler's death spread rapidly throughout Berlin. On the streets, in stores, and in bars, there was only one topic of conversation the Führer had been poisoned. The second number has been deleted. He couldn't recall how long he had been sitting motionless like this. With glassy eyes. Hitler did not show it, but the news of the double's death shocked him. In a few days, Hitler, alive and unscathed, will appear in a parade in Berlin. The panic over the Führer's death will subside. Those who spread rumors about the death of the Reich Chancellor will be declared mentally unstable and sent to mental institutions for compulsory treatment. From that moment forward, no one would speculate about the miraculous resurrection of Hitler, who would increasingly utilize doubles henceforth. The year 1943, Zaporizhia, USSR. He shook hands and smiled at the enthusiastic cheers. Nazi soldiers were proud of their Fuhrer. He was fearless, even willing to fly to the front lines to personally boost the morale of the troops. Congratulations, cheers of joy. Hitler was not inclined to give speeches, but he enjoyed being photographed. He was already walking to his car when he heard a panicked whisper behind him. 
For a moment, it seemed to Hitler that someone was scrutinizing him closely. This feeling haunted him for a long time, ever since the day he first stared into the eyes of death. The year is 1933, Breslau, Poland. His back was aching, his hands were hurting, but Celeb did not stop working. He wanted to finish his work as soon as possible. Polish those large soldier boots and return home as soon as possible. His wife celebrated her birthday today. Celeb didn't have enough money to give her a beautiful gift. So he had to work overtime to afford a silk shawl from a shop that his wife admired so much. Finally, he put down the brush and reached for the iron coin. Celeb lifted his head and locked eyes with the German officer, and the hand holding the coin froze. The German could not take his eyes off Celeb. The awkward silence lingered. Suddenly, the German got up and forcefully grabbed Celeb by the shoulders. The silhouettes of several soldiers appeared from behind. In an instant, they grabbed him, and Celeb didn't even have time to comprehend how he ended up in the car. He fought, yelled, but it was all in vain. Somewhere behind, outside the window, his past life remained. Celeb believed that he would come back here, that it was all a misunderstanding, and that he would be set free soon. However, that day was the last time Celeb saw the streets of his native Poland. The story of Hitler's most famous double involves a man named Celeb. It was Müller who mentioned that he had discovered this individual. He informed Hitler that there was such a person, strikingly similar to him. Despite the fact that Celeb had a completely different hairstyle, lacked a mustache and was slightly heavier and shorter, Rattenhuber, the head of the Reich Chancellery's security and Hitler's bodyguard, began working with this double. A small Catholic monastery is located in the town of Frontera, situated on the border between Germany and Poland. Externally, this building is indistinguishable from thousands of other churches. However, there were neither altars nor icons inside. No one had any idea that instead of cells, there were expansive rooms that precisely mirrored the layout of the Reich Chancellery, and instead of worship, clones were being produced there, specifically duplicates of the Great Fuhrer. The following days would be difficult for Celeb. He will be fed only once a day to help him lose weight. Only vegetables will be provided. He had to become a vegetarian. He will be taught to walk and talk differently. They will help him grow bushy antennae and create a new hairstyle. It will reach the point of absurdity. He will be taught to bite his nails. What is all this for? He will understand it when he sees himself in the mirror. The biggest challenge was that Hitler was fundamentally a rather grandiose personality, which led to the following issue. Celeb's behavior needed to be made consistent with Hitler's. The same mannerisms, the same gestures, roughly the same pronunciation and diction. And Müller mentions that he had to work with this stand-in for almost three years, or even more. The celebrity now stood in line with everyone else. Double of the Führer number four, a person who will either live or die in a few minutes. It depended on Hitler's decision. Celeb's heart was pounding wildly. With every step, Adolf was getting closer to him. He is already looking into Celeb's eyes, and this gaze made the Pole feel sick. A lump formed in his throat and his arms and legs shook. He didn't dare to raise his head. 
Hitler did not consult anyone about anything, but for some reason, Celeb understood. There's a reason why this man is so meticulous in his choices. He will not point at everyone. And then he didn't even want to think about what would happen next. Numbers 247. These were the most beautiful words he had heard in years. They meant one thing. The Fuhrer favored him, which means he will survive. He will not meet the same fate as the others. Celeb could barely hold back his tears. He was both happy and unhappy at the same time. Yes, at this very moment, he had delayed his own death. But for how long, who knows? Suddenly, a panicked whisper was heard from behind. He looked around and wept. For the sake of sacred Germany. The last thing he saw was a bright flash, and then Caleb fell. When he regained consciousness, scared soldiers gathered around him. As it turned out, the bullet whizzed very close to the face. Another inch, and no one would have been able to help Celeb. Meanwhile, the guards were already apprehending the criminal. They did not know that they did not save Hitler at all. No one was aware of this at all, except for the Fuhrer himself and his inner circle, including SS Chief Heinrich Müller, who shared this story after the war. Today, it is very challenging to determine how many body doubles Hitler had. Eight is the largest number that occurs. For instance, his maid mentioned that Hitler had doubles in several cities, specifically in places like Berlin, Munich, and others. It was a brilliant strategy. Surround yourself with body doubles, let them risk their lives, thereby safeguarding the real Fuhrer. Hitler was victorious. He already considered himself invincible, believed that death would not touch him. And he made a mistake, because he completely overlooked the threat from his own associates. July 20th, 1944, Hitler's Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia. Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg could barely control his wildly beating heart. At today's meeting, he was expected to present a report on the formation of new SS divisions. However, this did not concern the colonel in the slightest. He had been devising a plan to assassinate Hitler for six months, and now it was finally time to execute his plan. Come on, we don't have much time. The colonel was unaware of the existence of Führer's doubles, so he didn't realize how fortunate he truly was. Beside him was a real tyrant. This meeting was very important, and the leader had to be there himself. Why would he need a stand-in here? Hitler trusted his entourage. Here, among the generals, he felt safe. But it turned out it was in vain. The colonel's hands were shaking. But Klaus did not hesitate. He bent down and put his briefcase under the table. Exactly two meters from Hitler. Excuse me, I have to go. None of those present even had a hint that their death was lurking in the briefcase. It was a brilliant plan that was bound to work. One thing the colonel didn't realize was that destiny would disrupt his calculations. Just a few seconds before the explosion, one of the officers, oblivious to the danger, will shift Klaus's briefcase. The bomb will be on the other side of the table. At the moment of the explosion, a heavy oak shield will cover Hitler, thereby protecting him from the impact of the lethal wave. The Fuhrer will endure. However, the explosion will have severe consequences for Adolf. His face will be scorched in the fire. 
Due to damage to the eardrums, the Fuhrer will have impaired hearing, and due to a leg injury, he will limp for the rest of his life. However, there will also be quite peculiar consequences that Hitler's associates will not be able to explain. April 24, 1945, Berlin. General Weidling pleaded with the Führer for forgiveness, to spare his life, not to execute him. Yes, he lost ground, fell back under the onslaught of the Red Army, but he will certainly rectify everything. May only Hitler spare him. He spoke and spoke, but the leader didn't seem to hear anything. Pale face, frozen expression. General Weidling would later describe this meeting in his memoirs. He will not only meticulously record the minute details of the conversation with the Führer, but also remember his appearance. Hitler's pale, tired face showed no emotion. It seemed like nothing special, except for one significant detail. Weidling did not mention a single word about the burn on Hitler's face, which remained with him as a reminder of the explosion that occurred in the bunker. Weidling might not have been aware of these medical details from the Führer's life. The general's attention was drawn to the leader's strange behavior. After some time, Hitler appeared to regain his senses. Remind me of your last name. The commander heard it, but it was hard to believe. Hitler could not have forgotten Weidling's name as he had an exceptional memory. Why did he ask? So what's your last name? The year is 1940, Poland, Auschwitz concentration camp. He looked at the people in uniform and trembled with his entire body, praying to God for just one thing, that these people would not discover him, would not spot him in the crowd. The famished and weary prisoners of Auschwitz only hoped for a miracle that would rescue them from certain death in the gas chamber. The soldiers called out names and forcibly dragged the frightened, exhausted people forward. They were sobbing, pleading for mercy, but the condemned were already being escorted to the barracks. And then his name was called once, and then again. Klaus Buschter, please follow me. He couldn't move. Klaus realized that he wasn't going to survive. He is Jewish, and the Nazis targeted them first. Buster had no idea that he was required for something completely different. A few years later, he would stand in a line alongside nine other Hitlers, trying to muster all his willpower. But Buster was not good at it. Candidate number seven was so nervous that you could hear his teeth chattering. For a year, the former concentration camp detainee was nourished and coached, and he proved to be a talented actor, but now he couldn't gather himself together. He knew that if Hitler discovered he was a Jew, it would be the end. Most likely, Buster will be sent back to the internment camp. Klaus shuddered. Suddenly, he heard a soft, muffled laugh. Buster looked up and met Hitler's gaze. The Führer was amused by the scared, trembling prisoner who was chattering his teeth loudly and could not control himself. Klaus quickly looked down. The decision was made. Numbers 247. Klaus did not hold back. He fell to his knees and sobbed loudly. His frail, frayed nerves eventually failed. It was a bitter, regrettable victory. But it was the only chance to save my life. So what's your last name? 
Of course, Buster did not recognize General Weidling, as Buster was a duplicate, the seventh double of Hitler. Unlike the actual Hitler, he couldn't recall the general's name because he had never met him in person, much like many other individuals he had to interact with since he started substituting for the Fuhrer at the battlefront. Weidling would write that on that day, Hitler not only refrained from executing him, but also appointed him as the General Commandant of Berlin. Weidling never learned that it was not the Fuhrer who spared his life that day. It's fascinating, but it was the Jewish Klaus Buster who replaced Hitler in the final days of the war. This information was first published in the American edition of National Police. The researchers then obtained unique extracts from the Gestapo file archives. Based on this information, the double of the number seven regularly replaced the Fuhrer starting in March 1945. This would seem incredible if it weren't for another substantial piece of evidence. According to the memories of Hitler's entourage, in the final months of the war, not only did Hitler's behavior change, but his handwriting did as well. His handwriting became illegible. We decided to conduct our own investigation, and for this, we consulted a graphologist. Alexander Farmagay has been studying people's handwriting for over 20 years and can readily identify not only an individual, but also their personality through their writing style. Let's first comprehend the situation overall. These are all different handwriting styles, correct? And through handwriting, one can discern the personality and traits of the individual who is writing. Of course. Could you please tell me which elements of handwriting indicate certain traits of a person's personality? Generally, one can identify dozens of different characteristics in handwriting, and a person involved in specialized or psychological analysis. And words, etc. Even aspects like margins while writing are taken into account. So let's start our experiment. Let's examine the handwriting of a specific individual. Before us is Adolf Hitler's handwriting, as though Adolf Hitler himself wrote it all. But can we assert here that it was written by different individuals? Can we identify such characteristics? It could be argued that Hitler underwent personality changes throughout his life, and this was reflected in his signature. If you examine his signatures from, for instance, 1920 and 1940, you can assert that they belong to the same individual. However, if you scrutinize the signatures, Hitler's signatures from later years, such as 1942 and 1944, have several distinct characteristics that would be significant to forensic scientists who specialize in signature identification. This refers to a change in the direction of the signature itself and some elements of the signature. In earlier versions, the signature was more horizontal, and the final element in the signatures from 1942, 1944, and subsequent years is oriented more downwards. That is, initially there was the actual Hitler, whom we see here in a photograph along with the signature from his passport and, let's say, his signatures from 1920, 1923, 1934, and so forth. But in 1942, 1944, and thereafter, it could have been a different person, it is surprising, but Hitler's handwriting from the 45th year is significantly different from the document signed by the Fuhrer earlier. Certainly, the physical injuries that Hitler sustained from the explosion in the bunker could have influenced his handwriting, but they could not have completely altered it. One could theorize that it was the Fuhrer's body double, not the Fuhrer himself, in the bunker when the war ended. But under such circumstances, what happened to the real Hitler? 1944, Berlin. Leader Bormann secretly suggested redeployment across the ocean to the south later. He was dictating this telegram and his voice was trembling. 
After the bomb detonated in the bunker, Hitler lost control of himself. The fire disfigured his face, gave him no peace, and caused pain in his leg. The leader could not forget the events of that day. If not for a miraculous event, he would have died. This thought drove him mad. Hitler understood that he could not feel secure even among his closest associates. But where should one seek salvation? Germany actually lost the war. The soldiers of the once invincible army are retreating. Tanks with red stars will soon arrive in Berlin. He has to run away. But how? The leader knew he was being watched. All intelligence agencies around the world dream of capturing Hitler. To distract them, we need to make them believe that Hitler is in Berlin. But how is it done? Leave a tip? But they will quickly find out about it. No replica can fully replace Adolf. We had to do something urgently. And the leader finally made up his mind. After the fall of Berlin, Soviet troops discovered a telegram dictated by Hitler to Martin Bormann in the Reich Chancellery, but they kept this discovery secret for a long time. The Soviet intelligence reported multiple times. Since 1943, the SS has been devising a secret escape plan for Hitler. This plan was called the Rat Line. The escape route consisted of a series of covert stops in Austria, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Argentina. However, did Hitler succeed in implementing this plan? Did the Fuhrer truly fool the entire world and evade punishment? April 20th, 1945, Berlin. Hitler sat pale, immobile, like a wax figure. He didn't immediately notice the secretary entering the office. He did not hear the woman reporting about the generals who were waiting for the Fuhrer at the meeting. He turned his icy, glazed gaze towards the woman and suddenly seemed to regain his senses. Mrs. Junge screamed in terror as Hitler rushed to her aid. She could barely understand what the Fuhrer was talking about. It was unheard of, Hitler cried. He pleaded to be released or for the abuse to stop. Ms. Young did not have time to listen to him. People rushed into the office. Among them was the Fuhrer's personal physician, Dr. Morell. Hitler was administered an injection and he calmed down, becoming as placid as a wax doll once again. He behaved very oddly. It seemed as if he was a puppet being manipulated. This is how the secretary describes Adolf Hitler in her memoirs, but in reality, it was his seventh double. Klaus Buster. It was an ingenious plan devised by Hitler himself, drugging his double, intentionally reducing him to a vegetative state. This is done to make him submissive, and simultaneously convince his intelligence that the Fuhrer is now essentially a living corpse. After the explosion, he lost his sanity and fell into drug addiction, so that no one doubts that the leader of the Reich is in Berlin. He didn't flee. Sick and frail, Hitler stayed at his command post, preparing to perform a ritualistic sacrifice on the day Berlin was captured by ending his own life through suicide. The unconscious Buster couldn't comprehend anything. He merely saw a flash before plunging into darkness. He was executed under the orders of SS Chief Heinrich Miller, then cremated and buried in such a manner that his remains would be easily discovered. The unfortunate lookalike was also unaware that the body of a deceased woman who was posthumously cast as Eva Braun would be placed beside him. A detailed analysis of these remains also suggested that they were probably neither Hitler nor Eva Braun. 
A major issue was associated with the teeth of these corpses. Regarding Eva Braun, it's hard to believe that a woman like her didn't take care of her teeth, as the teeth of this deceased individual were far from perfect. Concerning Hitler, shortly before his death, he had ordered a dental bridge. Indeed, the discovered corpse did possess this dental bridge. However, it was not affixed, giving the impression that it was merely placed into the mouth of the corpse. The Führer's ingenious plan succeeded. When the Hamburg radio announced Hitler's suicide, no one had any doubts about its veracity. No one questioned why Hitler simultaneously bit into a cyanide capsule and shot himself in the temple. Why did he order to set himself on fire and bury himself in the ground? The entire world believed that Hitler died a soldier's death. He ordered his own body to be cremated so that he would not be ridiculed. No one suspected that it was a grand spectacle orchestrated by Hitler himself. It seems unbelievable, but researchers suggest that the Fuhrer could indeed have escaped from besieged Berlin. There is scant information about this, but there is some evidence. More and more information is surfacing, suggesting that Hitler managed to escape and spent the remainder of his life in Argentina. The Eichmann family, who were essentially financial intermediaries for the Third Reich, provide the most convincing proof of Hitler's residence in Argentina. It was under the command of the Third Reich that massive construction was undertaken in Argentina, including airstrips, airfields for airplanes, and residential buildings for future settlers. Soldiers of the Smirsch Battalion could not recuperate. Adolf Hitler is reported to have died in two different ways. But which one is true, and does it even matter? It will soon become clear that there isn't. We were able to locate a unique individual. During World War II, Boris Sokolov served as a military cameraman. And it was this individual who, in May 1945, personally witnessed and even photographed Hitler's doubles in the Berlin bunker. This man has agreed to grant us an exclusive interview to finally unveil the secret of Adolf Hitler's death. What made me realize that it was Hitler's double, not Hitler himself, was that when we pulled back the blanket, he was still wearing his socks. and I immediately thought that Hitler couldn't possibly be in patchwork socks. This must be his double, of course. It was difficult to identify Hitler from the first burnt corpse. The second dead Fuhrer caused no less doubt. He looked strikingly similar, this Hitler double, but his nose was broken at this spot, oddly pale, and there was a bullet hole in his forehead. Yet there was no blood. Nothing at all. You know, his sideburns were identical, and his hair was styled in the same manner as Hitler's. On his chest was the Iron Cross ribbon, which he had been awarded during the First World War. He always wore that ribbon. In other words, they looked very similar. Boris Sokolov maintains a unique photograph in his personal archive. Here he is, standing with his friends next to Hitler's dead body. For instance, we discovered a photograph of the actual Adolf Hitler and compared it with this picture. There are a lot of differences. It was these differences that were noticed by Soviet soldiers and photographers who were the first to see the bodies of several Nazi leaders. I personally knew it was his doppelganger. 
Well, there might have been doubts. It could have been anything. Could have dispelled any rumors, you know? About the fact that he committed suicide or something else. Nevertheless, I photographed him not as Hitler, but as a Hitler's double. Neither Hitler's dentist nor his otolaryngologist could identify the real Adolf Hitler among the two corpses. The names of the deceased are also disclosed. They are Buster, the Jew from Antwerp, number seven in the Gestapo files, and Celeb, the Pole, number four. The Soviet authorities classified these testimonies. They won't disclose any information about the first body found. The second one, which is burned, will be identified as Adolf Hitler. The only piece of evidence is a fragment of a skull that is still kept in the FSB archives. What happened to the actual Fuhrer? For many years, this remained a secret, but it was eventually disclosed by Heinrich Müller during interrogations in the United States. Here is the document that Müller presented during the interrogation. According to this, on April 26, 1945, Hitler was allegedly supposed to escape to Barcelona via a high-speed plane. All of the leader's closest associates were to fly with him. However, it appears that at the last minute, Hitler crossed out several names, leaving only ten people, including himself and Ava Brown, his longtime girlfriend, whom he had just married. But where could they have gone? Researchers suggest several possible locations for the Fuhrer's relocation. Brazil, Antarctica, and most likely, Argentina. There are numerous post-war photographs featuring Hitler. The families of those Argentine magnates who had direct ties with the Nazis simply preserve these as relics and do not display them to anyone. They even interviewed a housekeeper who had been employed at the family's estate for a considerable period. When shown a picture of Hitler, unaware of his true identity, she claimed to have seen that individual. The Führer implemented a brilliant plan. Survive at all costs, escape right under the noses of global intelligence. But did Hitler really succeed? There is no definitive answer yet. Currently, increasing evidence suggests that the Führer managed to stage his own death as his final grand display and then disappear dramatically.